Welcome everyone to this Talks at Google virtual event. My name is Erin Beller and I am an environmental scientist with the real estate and workplace services sustainability team at Google, where my job focuses on bringing biodiverse, beautiful and accessible nature into the cities and communities that Google calls home. Before we get started and I introduce Doug, I just wanna remind you that we'll be taking questions for Doug toward the end of the talk. So as you think of questions throughout the talk, please be sure to add them to the live chat that's on the right of your screen. So I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Doug Ptolemy. Doug is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. And he's also the author of several popular books, including the New York Times bestseller, Nature's Best Hope, released in 2020, which provides practical and inspiring guidance on how to use native plant to turn our yards into wildlife habitat and conservation corridors. He's also the author of The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees, published in 2021, about the incredible oak tree um, that's uh, near and dear to our own hearts of urban greening at Google as well. Doug is expert at connecting ecological science findings with conservation in the cities and landscapes that we all call home. His work forms the basis of the National Wildlife Federation's Incredible Native Plant Finder. And in 2021, he also co-founded Homegrown National Park, which is this grassroots call to action to create tens of millions of new acres of native planting and wildlife habitat through lawn conversion across the US. So Doug, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you very much, Aaron. I'm assuming you can all see my screen. I do want to talk to you today about my idea of what nature's best hope is. But before I do that, uh, I want to talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea of nature's best hope is. Uh, of course, we lost uh, Ed Wilson the day after Christmas, a tremendous loss to science in general, serious loss to the world of conservation. He had a lifelong passion for biodiversity, and he tried to save it his entire career. 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. It was a culmination of that effort. Uh, and he had a very simple message. He said, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet if we're going to save life on any of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. Uh, he didn't tell us a whole lot about how we might do that. Now, of course, uh, to, to conservation biologists, saving half of the earth sounds like a great idea. But you know, half of the earth, half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we have, we have nearly 8 billion people in all of our roads and airports and detritus in the other half. So uh, we're all scratching our heads. How can we do that? Well, I think we can uh, realize EO's dream. And that's what I really wanna talk about today. But in order to do that, we need a new approach to conservation. First, let's talk about what happened uh, on the East Coast of North America in 2019. We had what we call an oak mast. All the members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it, but I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through that hole. Then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze, made it look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. That's a dangerous time for this larva because there are a lot of things that want to eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, converts itself to a pupa and then surprisingly stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. Uh, a lot of people think weevils have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. Uh, and their mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in it, and that is how the larva gets down into the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? Well, the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they come out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of tiny little temnothorax ants, where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they've left an acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. 
What's my point? That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. All over the country, jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn from the tree and fly up to a mile from the tree. Then they tap it below the surface of the soil. And the object is they're going to go back in, in uh, the wintertime and get something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they're actually planting three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and, and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. And you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you had the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all afternoon, all night, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. But the point I wanna to make today is that these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, uh, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over its wonderful view and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. Uh, and there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cows. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, and many of them are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas, the tiny remnants of their former selves, and each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the amount of nature we need them we need to, to sustain, to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. And you might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. Uh, and I don't know, but I suspect that we thought the, the earth, our nest, was so large that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this, a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now the UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. Uh, that's not just a headline. That's something that we have to make sure does not happen. We need those species to support ourselves. We can be selfish about it. We cannot allow these species to disappear. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if earth lost insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems. But the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Remember, humans are products of nature. We're totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide for us. Here are just some of the things that that uh, plants do that we benefit from, like the production of oxygen, pretty obvious. 
cleaning our water, slowing its, to the, its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use, capturing carbon, pulling it out of the atmosphere, building its tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping it into the ground. Enormously important today. Plants build topsoil, hold it in place. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather. They convert sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight, and that will be hard. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today's a terrible idea because we've got so many people that need those services. You know, we do have parks, we have preserves, but there are too few of them. They are too scattered, they're too isolated, and they're too small to provide the amount of services that we need. So we now need to start producing ecosystem services. We need to start doing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes like this. There have been uh, visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Alda Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is, the oldest task in human history is, history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been good at that, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area and going to another area doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Adel Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could uh, develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day. Unfortunately, it's still embedded in our own culture that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, what I wanna to argue today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we need to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not, I'm not being accurate. We do want to conserve any parts of nature that are actually left. But what we really need to do is reconstruct it. We need to rebuild it, restore it. And before you tell me that we'll never put it back the way it actually was, uh, I know that, but we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions that I opened the talk with to create functional ecosystems, even if that's not exactly what was there before we came along. But there are building blocks of ecosystems. So all species don't contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with those building blocks. And there's two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants and the, the pollinators that allow those plants to, to reproduce. Um, they, of course, are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food through photosynthesis and then storing the food in their plant parts, mostly their leaves. So now we have uh, the food that supports all the animal life on terrestrial earth in plant leaves. We have to get that food to the animals. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants, uh, typically as insects, and it turns out that caterpillars are enormously important in terms of supporting animals. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we, we have failed. Those are going to be uh, dead end uh, food webs and eventually collapsed ecosystems. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. We've got a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. Um, they of course are at our feeders all winter long eating seeds, but when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch uh, to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. So let's just say, and there's a lot of evidence for this, that um, birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? 
well, that's a good question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? Uh, it takes a lot, um, not one or two a day. Uh, it takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to count those. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you might, because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way without those caterpillars, without those insects, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the uh, original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the bird, terrestrial birds, into the species that require insects and the species that do not. Things like uh, doves and finches can actually reproduce on seeds. Well, they didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, you lose the birds. So we need a new goal for uh, the way we landscape. In the past, we've landscaped with one goal in mind, and that is to make them pretty. Okay, well, we can still make them pretty, but we also now have to make them ecologically functional. We have to have functional food webs in those landscapes, which means we have to put some caterpillars in there. So how do we add caterpillars to a landscape? Well, you add them by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. That seems pretty easy, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the ones that do, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. Think of the monarch butterfly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the burning bush and all the barberry and all the ginkgos and all the eucalyptus and all the things that we, we like to landscape with, typically from Asia or other countries, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You have to have milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? because the plants have made them that way. The plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves. And they develop specialized adaptations to get around those particular defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to the compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with the plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating those plants. So if you take away the milkweeds in your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not gonna start to make a living on hostas. Can't do it. So it has two choices, go find milkweed someplace else or disappear. Now there are three kinds of plants, plants that contribute plants that don't contribute, and plants that actually detract. So plants that are contributing, they're contributing to ecosystem function. They're adding food to it. I've got a picture of an oak here because it is the best contributor in this country. Plants that don't contribute, non-contributors, um, things like the ginkgo are just sitting there. The ginkgo produces zero caterpillars, but it's not invasive. It's not moving around. And then we have plants that are invasive moving around. Not only do they make no caterpillars, but they're invading our natural areas and pushing out the plants that do. They're actively degrading ecosystem function. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. And I'm going to give you three uh, examples of how uh, choosing the right plants can actually restore the biodiversity in a particular place. This is where my wife uh, Cindy and I live in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is what our house looked like when we moved in. Uh, it was a piece of a farm that was broken up. The area had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So very few, uh, certainly very few woody plants there. Our goal was to re restore uh, the biodiversity to this land. But to do that, we have to bring the caterpillars back. So I'll give you a few examples of how we did that. 
I wanted to see if we'd get the Canadian outlet to live at our house. This is what a Canadian outlet looks like. I've never even seen a Canadian outlet, but, um, and that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian outlets unless you have meadow rue. And we didn't have any meadow rue. The meadow rue had been stripped long, hundreds of years ago, long gone. So we got some meadow rue seeds and planted them and they grew very nicely. But this was early on and I actually had very little faith that Canadian Alice would be able to find my meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and check it for about a month after we, we planted it. And then I was walking by for another reason. It was covered with, with uh, Canadian Alice. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. So now we have a good population of meadow rue and Canadian Alice. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful moth actually has nothing to do with goldenrod. That's a misnomer. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. We didn't have any Biden's Aristosa, but I knew where some Biden's was in a power line cut about uh, 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Well, it took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Biden's, but it did. And, and now we have a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. Wanted the Hackberry Emperor because it's a, it's a butterfly that ought to be here, not because it's the prettiest butterfly. Uh, but as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry, so I planted it. We had to wait four years for the, hack, for the butterfly to find my, my Hackberry, but they did. I looked at one of the Hackberry branches uh, last June. There were nine Hackberry Emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So now we've added six species to the property, and that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that specialized on goldenrod. Like the brown hooded owlet, uh, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, and many others, the goldenrod gall moth. Goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars in my area. Planted Virginia creeper. I know a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's got good fall color, can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good uh, uh, ground cover. Uh, it produces nutritious berries for the birds in the fall, very high in fat. It's a great pollinator plant, even though the flowers are small and inconspicuous. You know it's, it's in bloom because there's a big cloud of native bees around it. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the primary component of cardinal diets when they're feeding their young. Things like the Pandora sphinx, and it's beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just a few examples of the plants that we put uh, back in our yard, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because uh, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing for your local landscape, what it's contributing to the local food web, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks uh, from uh, mostly from acorns, which means they were free, or a few from uh, bare, bare root, about a foot and a half bare root whips that cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web by bringing in creatures like this, the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths use the oaks in my yard. And they use it right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaf. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. Now I'm showing you this not to convince you that the caterpillar is going to kill the oak. It's not. The oak will be fine. But that the oak is contributing to the local food web immediately. This is what our house looks like or will look like in a week or so when the leaves pop out. Uh, we put a lot of plants back. And uh, I about five years ago, I started to count all the species of moths that occur at our yard because we have learned that the, the number of moths that make those caterpillars that run our food web are an excellent index of how of the quality of the ecosystem that you have restored. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,140 species of moths that I've recorded so far. 
Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land mass, we're supporting 44% of the, all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these moth species are bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since, since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. So don't give up, don't give up. We can turn these terrible headlines around. But I know what you're thinking. Uh, we've got 10 acres. A lot of people don't have that much land. Will it work in suburbia on smaller plots? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Um, and they're in the middle of suburbia. They're surrounded by people with the big lawns. Well, the first thing they did when they moved in was get rid of their, their invasive uh, plants. So the big one was Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle from Asia. They planted 75 species of native plants, put in a water feature for the birds, and then sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they are up to 149 species, including 35 warbler species. Now, just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on, on 0.6 acres, smaller lands? Of course it does. How about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house uh, in Chicago. That's tower back there is uh, at O'Hare Airport. She's right next to the airport, one-tenth of an acre. And she's not connected to any uh, natural area at all. Now, one-tenth of an acre is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre. Pam's actually a landscape designer. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, little water feature, and then she sat back and started to count the birds that have used her yard. And she's up to 124 bird species so far, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. Okay, there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. We want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we have to shrink the area that's in lawn. As of 2005, we had more than 40 million acres of, of lawn. That's, that's an area the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now we know we need, we need lawn uh, because it's a status symbol and we also need lawn to display our, our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we restored half of all of that area by putting in native plants? We could create what we're calling homegrown national park. It would give us 20 million acres to work with. And homegrown national park would be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park would be the biggest park in the country. Uh, what we're doing is, is trying to create uh, the message Get the message that everybody uh, has a uh, very important opportunity to be part of, of the future of conservation by recording their little piece of the world, the area they're going to restore on the map. They put in their location, the amount of area they're restoring, and their little piece of the map will, will light up. We want that message to go viral using social media to do it. Homegrown National Parks product uh, is, is national or even global awareness not just of the problem, but of the solutions to the problem. We want to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional and that everybody owns a responsibility to, to sustaining it, to rebuilding it. It also provides measurable conservation progress. Benefits of homegrown grown national park is that it converts hope to action. It's aspirational. It doesn't reply, rely on governmental support, uh, so that makes, makes it fast. We can do it right away. Merges a number of the, or all of the national conservation efforts, Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Sierra Club, all those people um, can get themselves on the map. It's within one visual. And by the way, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, and once the map is built, it's going to reveal holes in biological corridors uh, that connect wild places so that we can we can focus on those areas. Um, so it's going to look something like this, something like the COVID maps you see in, in the Times um, when we get it fully populated. Each county will have a particular color depending on conservation, on, on the uh, amount of participation. So Hunger National Park is a science-based grassroots call to action 
that can address both climate change and biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity crisis simultaneously, the two major crises that Earth is facing today. So we're all gonna get ourselves on the map. The second thing is we have to think about the plants that we actually put into our yard. Some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. What's a keystone plant? Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch disappears, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of, of the local food webs, the food webs collapse just as well. And that's because just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that, that support that house. They're essential. Uh, we've been trying to build ecological houses with wallpaper uh, for the last hundred years, and that doesn't work. You're not through building your ecological house once the keystone plants are there, but they are an essential part of it. So the question is no longer simply, are native plants better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. But the question really is, do we want to landscape with the plants that contribute the most to ecosystem function or not? The plants that contribute the most belong to the genus uh, Quercus, oaks. We have 91 species of oaks in this country. They're supporting collectively over 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. But you can find out the, the uh, most productive plants where in your county where you live. If you go to Native Plant Finder and National Wildlife Federation and put in your zip code, then the rank list of the most powerful woody plant genera and herbaceous genera will pop up for your county. We'll come back here. Okay, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to attract a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our, our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. Um, there's research, uh, particularly from Europe, telling us that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline uh, around the world. And these are all the ways that uh, lights are killing our insects, particularly those moths that create those all-important caterpillars. But to me, this is good news uh, because we have to turn around insect declines. We've already lost 45% of the insects on the planet and they're the things that, that run the world, remember. So if we can do that by just flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. And there's a lot of switches we have to, we have to flick, folks. But I know what you're gonna say, oh, I can't turn out the light over my garage or my barn or my front yard, my front porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, take the white light out of your security bulb light and put in a, a yellow bulb. Yellow uh, LED is the best because yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to nocturnal insects. If we turned out, uh, our, if we switched out our, our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of of uh, insects and also millions of dollars because LEDs are certainly much more uh, energy efficient. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do uh, is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as a caterpillar on the leaves and then they drop off the tree and wiggle their way beneath the soil surface when it's not compacted and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is uh, under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. Uh, and we mow and compact the soils under our, our trees, under our plants, so that they're way too hard for the caterpillars to get underground. So the typical way that we landscape becomes an ecological trap. The moths come in, lay their eggs in the leaves, the caterpillars develop, and then they fall down and die. Uh, so this is what we usually do. We, we have a tree in a yard, and, and we're going to actually start measuring caterpillar survivorship in a situation like this this summer. But I guarantee it's going to be higher in a situation like this, where you have a tree, uh, and then you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood and a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. It's a soft landing. The caterpillars can fall down, easily get below ground because the soil's not compacted. Nobody's going to step on them. Nobody's going to squish them or mow them. Um, plenty of leaf litter under there. They can spin their cocoons. So survivorship will be much higher. This is a good place to do your spring ephemeral gardening. It's a good way to, to shrink the lawn. 
put beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. Then you have less lawn. You've got a lot more plants in your yard. All safe sites. Use your your um, native ground covers, things like uh, wild ginger or mayapple or foam flower or ferns, all wonderful safe sites. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one is serious. We've come to think of nature as if it's optional. Uh, and of course, if it's optional, then it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when, when resources are in short supply, when push comes to shove, nature will take a back seat. And of course, resources are always in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's a wall size poster there, uh, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save nature. We want to save wildlife for future generations to enjoy. Uh, that was Kennedy Roosevelt's argument for, for creating the national park system. These are beautiful places. We got to preserve them so that future generations can enjoy them. And I, I get that. Um, nature is enormously entertaining, but it's much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but we're if we restrict conservation efforts just to the, the uh, places where there's relatively few humans, we're going to fail because uh, those places are too small, they're too isolated, and there's not enough of them. David Quammen has a, a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests they're places on planet Earth without ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even if we've diminished it, we need to rebuild it. And that includes our yards, our corporate landscapes, our roadsides, even our agriculture. So we need, to, we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. This is what Na uh, Homegrown National Park is all about. It's about putting the plants back, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've destroyed them. Once we put the plants back, it'll be the first time in, in uh, modern history that humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of, of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth once said that the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We are very good at teaching uh, our, our kids and our peers about their rights, but we've been terrible about teaching them their obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now, the, the earth's problems are huge and most people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can turn out their lights, one person can put in a pollinator garden, we didn't talk about that. One person can get rid of the invasive plants that are on their, their properties, we didn't talk about that. One person can, can fire Mosquito Joe, we didn't talk about that. <clears throat> one person can, can use keystone plants, one person can join Homegrown National Park. One person can, can uh, totally revitalize the ecosystem where they live and it, it will it will enhance their local ecosystem rather than degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you're going to start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer, help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. As a volunteer, they will love you. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. <clears throat> Whether or not we, we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So thanks for living, uh, listening. Thanks for listening. And remember, you are nature's best hope.
Great. Well, thank you so much for that excellent talk, Doug. It's really exciting to um, hear about your work on Homegrown National Park and with Oaks. Um, and yeah, we're very excited to have a discussion here and a reminder as well that um, we'll, be we'll be continuing this discussion um, on the uh, link that will be dropped in the chat um, at one. Now, Erin, I've lost my cursor here and I can't stop screen sharing. Oh, there it oh, is. No. There it is. I got it. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. um, so yeah, I think um, you alluded to this sort of the end of your talk, but it would be great to hear more um, about what you'd recommend for um, those of us who live, you know, as you mentioned, when, you know, small lot sizes who, you know, maybe have a shard of a green roof or maybe in a, you know, tenant in common situation where we don't have perfect control. Um, you know, what do you see as a way, the best ways to get involved with Homegrown National Park beyond the volunteering? Well, you know, there's there's no space that's too small. If you have room for a single flower pot on your balcony, uh, you put in a, a native aster. The native bees will use it. The monarchs will visit it on their on their uh, migratory flight. Or if you're a little bit bigger flower pot, put in some milkweeds. The monarchs will use that. A bigger flower pot, put in put in Joe pie weed. It produces a lot of of uh, nectar. Very good for for butterflies. Um, and certainly, if you can build an entire green roof, you can do do a lot. But another thing I've thought about is if you live in an apartment and it has some trees in its landscape, I know you don't own them, but I bet if you talk to the superintendent and said, I'm going to adopt one of those trees, I'm going to put a bed around it, I'm going to take care of it, you won't have to do a thing, I'm going to build a safe site for those caterpillars, they'd probably say, great. And, you know, with all the people in the apartment complex, every tree could be adopted and you could have a very functional landscape. So there are things that people can do be beyond uh, volunteering. That's great. And uh, that links to a question I'm seeing in the in the um, chat. Um, someone who is in an apartment community who um, is wondering whether you have a specific material that um, that you recommend for convincing managers um, <laughs> to be inspired by this biodiversity vision. Yes, I've written three books about that. <laughs> That's exactly why I wrote, write these books is to to convince people who don't understand the seriousness of the problem. Or you can go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. There's a lot of, of much more uh, readily accessible material there. That's great. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether you can talk a little more, I guess, as we're thinking about the edge cases here. I mean, obviously, a lot of your work is really focused on the U.S. and North America. Um, I'm sure we have some listeners from outside of the country. And I'm curious whether you have recommendations for resources for folks where, you know, the NWF plant finder may not be as relevant, um, you know, where would you recommend they start? Well, we're actually working on that right now is to make lists for all over the world to make the native plant finder relevant. Um, those lists don't exist yet. Uh, so, you know, you can go to a, an individual country and I don't know the resources there very well, uh, but um, there are local experts who, who, now, the, the other, I just have to say the other countries aren't focused on the insects the way we have been. And it's a vital missing link, uh, which is why we feel compelled to make those lists. But um, there is a, a woman uh, in Ireland, Mary Reynolds, who uh, has, I think it's called the uh, We Are the Ark. You can visit her website and she's encouraging people to do the same thing, not just in Europe, but all over. So people are thinking about this pretty much everywhere. Uh, but it's using those keystone plants wherever you are is, is key to success. I, I really like the rug analogy that you use towards the end. And I'm wondering, um, you know, as, as we think about individuals kind of having the best impact possible, it reminded me of, you know, some of the um, literature and examples from people putting solar panels on their roof that a little bit of social pressure all of a sudden causes, you know, catalyzes a much bigger change. I wonder whether you've seen examples of similar things of kind of neighborhood scale interventions where, you know, urban greening, biodiversity spreads like wildfire through a block or a neighborhood. Like, are there things that we can do to help convince our neighbors or particularly inspiring examples of that? Well, this is this is the effort to change the culture where it will spread like wildfire. We, this is the getting it to go viral. And, you know, we're, we're starting to see that. Uh, I don't have any neighborhood examples where it has spread like wildfire yet. But, um, you know, most people, most people do what their peers are doing. So even if you're totally disconnected from nature, you don't care about nature at all, 
you'll still do what your neighbors are doing just so you can fit in. So I want to get to the point where enough people are doing this, where the rest will simply follow along because that becomes the norm. We see this out West where, where there's not enough water for lawns anymore. So now the guy with the big lawn is the social pariah. He's not the, the, uh, you know, he's not somebody anybody respects. And that happened very quickly. Um, you know, within 10 years, the, the lawn as a status symbol has disappeared from the West. So we can do that with biodiversity too. That's great. Um, I'd like to zoom out from the neighborhood scale to the city scale. And I see there's a question um, about um, the Hunger National Park and are there steps that we can take with local government to drive awareness and action? My local city provides rebates for tree canopy restoration, would love to scale it. And I guess I'll, I'll add on to that. Um, you know, any insights you've seen on how to best connect kind of native biodiversity with some of the kind of larger um, city scale policies, for example, around, um, you know, street tree ordinances or street tree lists. Right. Remember, you vote for city officials. And if you let them know that these are important issues, they they will listen because they they want you to vote for them. But there are there are statewide programs that I left out of the talk and, and trying to keep it short. But Minnesota has a cost sharing program to encourage uh, reducing lawn, and replacing it with uh, appropriate uh, Minnesota prairie plants. Uh, Pennsylvania has a, a lawn uh, conversion program. You get up to $5,000 per acre of lawn that you can convert. And of course, California has got, you get $3 per square foot rebate for every every square foot of lawn you, you take at. Um, so these these efforts, you know, you're not, not going to get rich doing it, but what it does is um, it changes the social the social conversation. It's a you know, this this is now socially acceptable. I'm not bucking the trend here. I'm I'm doing the what is best for the greater good, uh, and that's all a lot of people need. So those programs are popping up around. Um, there's a lot of efforts to to ban the sale of calorie pair or to um, uh, have a bounty on it. You take out a calorie pair, you get a free tree replacement. There's an article in the Washington Post, I think, just recently about that. So, um, yep, it's it's spreading. Excellent. Um, here's a question about um, the role of some of the, I guess, the other side of the private landowners, um, kind of the corporate, institutional, and commercial real estate across the U.S. and Obviously at Google, we um, are thinking quite a lot about native landscaping. For those of you who aren't familiar, go to Go Ecology, you can check it out. Um, but can you say a little bit more about the role of these kind of commercial or corporate private lands in homegrown national park? I think particularly given this kind of large sizes that these places often have. Yeah, they have enormous landscapes uh, and they also can set a really powerful example. Um, I can't cite you uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of uh, groups who are doing it actively yet. Um, but if we added up all the all the acreage owned by by corporations, um, or and and not just corporations, but you know places of worship, you know the Catholic Church is the largest landowner in the world. Um, these are not private citizens; these are big places owning a lot of land. And if it became standard, uh, that would be just you know, tremendously productive. Um, so I see a few um, questions from overwhelmed people who are saying, um, for those of us who are new to this, um, what is the best place to start? Um, so, for example, for this pollinator garden idea of really focusing on pollinators, you know, what's what's a resource that would say, you know, this is my particular location and zip code and how much space I want, you know, just tell me what to plant. You know, where where would you recommend folks start, like you have on your property? Okay, there's another uh, National Wildlife Federation website called um, Keystone Plants by Eco Region. So you you and it's pretty general right now. They've got the Eco Region Level One. We need to move it to Eco Region Level Two, and we're getting ready to do that. Uh, so it's a little bit more finely tuned. But you you look at the map. You say, okay, I live in this Eco Region, and it will give you the best plants for specialist pollinators. When you're planting a pollinator garden, you wanna plant for the specialist because the generalist will use those plants too. If you plant for the generalist, the, if you put in the zinnias and a bunch of non-native plants, butterfly bush and things that honeybees go to, which are non-native themselves, people say, oh, we're helping the pollinators. Were you helping one species of non-native bee um, and all the specialists can't use those. So we wanna help the specialists and then the generalist can, excuse me, go to those plants uh, as well. And that's on that National Wildlife Federation website. Great. 
Um, and I, as long as we're talking about pollinators, um, I'm sure you get asked about honeybees a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you see honeybees and native pollinators um, intersecting in these landscapes? Well, you know, honeybees were one of the first key, um, the first signals that that our, our insects are, are in trouble because there's something called colony collapse disorder that uh, people have been um, upset about for, oh boy, pushing 20 years now where fewer and fewer honeybees make it through the winter. Honeybees are very important pollinators for a number of our crops, which of course are also non-native and, and we, we want them to succeed. But um, our native bees did all the pollination before, essentially all the pollination before we brought over honeybees. So it's not like you need honeybee to do the pollination. Apples in Michigan, for example, can be pollinated just fine by native bees if you leave them in the landscape. But if you sterilize the landscape, like they've done in California with the almonds, you know, take away every plant except an almond tree, and then you have to bring in the honeybees and hives. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. You can restore the, the native bee pollinators and they'll do a lot of the, the pollination. The big problem now is there's not enough forage. There are not enough blooming plants anywhere to support both the native bees and the honey bees simultaneously. There could be, uh, so, uh, sorry, just my son. Um, but we got, we've got to get planting. I mean, that's what it's putting the plants back is all about, to create enough forage so that they're not competing with each other. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question about um, those of us who are new to gardening with a small plot. Um, is it better to plant as many different types of native plants as possible or focus on a few types? So yeah, how do you think, I guess, about making kind of habitats and ecosystems um, yeah, out of these native plants? That's a good question. If you have a small area, you can't do everything. Um, and the classic example I get is, is somebody who plants a single milkweed, a single milkweed stalk, that's called a ramet. And then of course the monarch comes, lays an egg on it, and one larva can strip that. And they'll, they'll, they'll call me up and they say, I planted milkweed for the monarchs, but a worm got on it, so I squished it. <laughs> the worm is the monarch, you know. You need a milkweed patch. So there's a minimum amount you need so that you can have successful reproduction of the insect you're targeting. Um, when, you're, when you're helping pollinators, they you don't want them to use a lot of energy going from plant to plant. So the more plants you have close together uh, that are good for them, the better off they're going to be. So I, th I think you want to compromise. You don't want just one species, but a few species that are, are plumped is probably the best. That's great. You know, with a pollinator garden, what you really want is a sequence of plants um, where they're blooming through the season. That's the hardest thing to achieve. But you need blooming plants from March all the way through October in most parts of this country to help all those native pollinators. So that's that's the trick you should focus on. Right. Focus on blooming times. That makes sense. Um, and I guess in a similar vein, you know, I know it can be challenging to really consider what counts as native what counts as a native plant for any particular area. And I'm curious, um, you know, as you think about geographic scale, how, how you think about for the place, how, how you think about that for the places you work. Yeah, you know, native plant is a plant that has, has interacted over evolutionary time with the plants and animals around it. Now plant communities do move. When the glaciers came down, it pushed plant communities all the way down to the Gulf Coast or many of them into Mexico. And then when the glaciers receded, they moved north again. They're still moving north. Um, so it's, it's not what plant was here for the last million years. That's not, not the way nature works, but it's the groups of things that interact. It's very obvious. If you bring a plant from, from Asia over here, it has never interacted with anything that's, that's, uh, in North America. I shouldn't say that ginkgo used to live here 7 million years ago, but within ecological time, it hasn't. If you take the blue spruce out of the Colorado Rockies and plant it in Delaware, it'll do fine, but it won't support anything in Delaware. It's, it's obviously not in its co-evolved ecosystem. So I'm, you know, I, I'm fairly loose about my definition of, of native. It doesn't have to be within 50 square feet of where you are. Uh, and, but some people are more strict and that's, that's fine. But you want to be within the food web of the creatures you're trying to support. And food webs are pretty big. If I want to support a, a, an insect that eats beech trees, beech trees occur from Florida to Canada. Um, and the, that insect will eat any beech from Florida to Canada. The beech won't grow 
the particular genotype has to come from, um, you know, essentially the latitude is called provenance, uh, where it's, it's adapted to. So provenance is more restrictive than our, our food webs. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, as we wrap up here, um, I want to think a little bit about the ecosystem services that you mentioned um, at the beginning of your talk. You know, I think you know, there are a lot of um, large initiatives that are going on um, nowadays, like the Trillion Tree Project, for example, these kind of major international scale initiatives that are, you know, focused, for example, on, um, you know, ecological benefits in addition to thinking about water and carbon sequestration, for example. How, how do you think about helping these types of initiatives really um, lean into the biodiversity benefit as well as the other ecosystem service benefits? Well, unfortunately, most of these giant tree planting projects have only been thinking about carbon sequestration and they're not thinking about the biodiversity impacts at all. They're focusing on eucalyptus and a whole bunch of non-native plants all over the world. And it's a terrible missed opportunity. It's one of the reasons we're rushing to make these lists so we can hand them to agencies like that and say, these are the plants that will sequester carbon and support biodiversity wherever you, you are. Um, because otherwise it's a, just a terrible lost opportunity. We, we have two crises on the planet, climate change and biodiversity. If we had no climate change, we would still have a biodiversity crisis. It's not something we can just ignore. And putting all these trees back is a wonderful idea if they're the right trees. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess as, as we think a little more about um, those kind of twinned crises of biodiversity loss and climate change, um, can you talk a little more about how how climate change is informing your thinking about um, how we use native plants in the urban environment, the suburban environment? Um, you know, how 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 would you recommend that we think about selecting native plants that are also climate adaptive, resilient um, for the next couple of decades? Yeah. I get asked all the time, should I be planting a plant from the south up up north because you know it's going to be warmer here later on? Uh, my, my reaction to that is no, you shouldn't, because climate change is focused a lot more on climate variability. We get these extremes. Yes, it gets extremely hot, but it also gets extremely cold and it gets extremely wet and extremely dry. dry. Um, we need the genetic variability of the plants to deal with that. If you, if you assume that, that you know, the earth is gently warming and you just move plants from the south up north, you're going to get a polar vortex and it's going to kill them all. Look what happened in Texas last year when we when it, it had a deep freeze all the way into Mexico. Even many native plants died because it got so cold so far south. So that's what you should be looking for for climate change. Uh, so how do you get genetic variability? Well, one thing you can do is avoid cultivars because they have zero genetic variability in them. Get the straight species that has the most genetic variability possible and, and cross your fingers and hope our plants can do it. Great. Uh, well, that seems like the, the perfect note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Doug, for a great talk and great conversation. And again, for those of you who want to join us, um, Denise will be uh, dropping a link in the chat again now on where you can join us for additional Q&A um, immediately following this. So thank you so much, all. Okay, I'm going to move over now.